Thank you. Good morning. My name is Gary Hoyt. I'm a friend of Stephen Cindy's, and some of you might remember that I have filled in here a time or two in the past. Glad to be able to be here to, today and help out Steve as they are on vacation. Start our, our worship service this morning with some announcements, and I know, Gary, you said you had one you'd like to make. Just a reminder that during fellowship time today, we're going to have our discussion um, with uh, pastors uh, noted of retirement. We have some things we need to discuss. Um, I'll probably finish my uh, counting with Keith of the offering and then head down so we can grab, grab something to eat, grab your drink, and, and probably start only oh, about 15 minutes after uh, the service ends. So we'll have a discussion at that time. Look forward to hearing your thoughts and, and answering any questions. Thank you, Gary. Are there other announcements that need to be made? Any questions about anything in the, in the bulletin? I guess I would say announcements, and I think the other invitation is that if you have a prayer request other than what's already printed in the bulletin, um, or if you'd like to give an update on something that you see there, any, anything else someone would like to share as we begin our time together this morning? We're good? All right. As a part of our call to worship, I would like to read from Psalm 42, just the first two verses. The psalmist writes, As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Those are just the first two verses. I encourage you to read the rest of that, maybe even later today. But I just want to call attention to, and I'm going to read it, these two verses again. Who is the psalmist talking to? And what does the psalmist desperately want to have happen? As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us today as we gather here to have the same mindset, to have the same heart, to have the same passion as the writer of this psalm, that we would long for you, God, For you are the living God, that we would long for you more than anyone or anything else. And when we ask that question, when can we come and appear before you, God? Just maybe today we would hear you say again, right now. Right now, come before me. Thank you, God, for always being there, waiting for us to come to you. Bless this time together as we worship in your name. Amen. Come thou almighty King.
Anybody watching the Olympics? Going to watch the Olympics? I can remember many, many years ago watching the Olympics and um, it was when I turned on the news, maybe it was the evening sports news, don't remember that part, but I do remember that they were giving the medals out to the women's gymnastics uh, uh, individuals in a particular event and the gold medal winner, you know, big smiles. The silver medalist is what drew my attention that particular day as I was watching because I remember saying to my wife, Melanie, look, look, quick, the silver medalist is not happy. I mean, the look on her face, you could tell very quickly that good, right, good, was not good enough. This person was good enough to make the, and this was a United States Olympic woman, gymnastics person, she was good enough to be on the Olympic team for the United States of America. She was good enough to compete and get the silver medal in the Olympics better than, any, better than anyone else in the world except for how many people? I don't want you to fade away too quickly here. One person. That's how good she was. But you could tell good was not good enough. My wife and I have four daughters. Several of those daughters have families. One of those families lives out in Adel. Grandsons play on the football team at Adel. I could be telling the same story about Iowa State, but I, I kind of want to stay away from my beloved Cyclones. This is true for them as well. You can kind of fill in the dots here, the, the blanks here as I say this, tell the story. So Adel football team, they're good enough a couple of years ago, good enough to go all the way to state, good enough to get to the championship game. But I'll tell you, the looks on their faces and the tears coming from their eyes, good. When they lost the championship game, good. Would you agree with me? They must have been good. It wasn't good enough. Are there times that for you, you remember good, I mean good, really good, wasn't good enough. I don't know if you have anything on that list, in that column, but whether you have a whole bunch of things that are already coming to mind, or whether you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. If, good, if I do something good, it's good enough for me. One way or the other, I hope that you're going to add either one more thing or the first thing to the list of when good is not good enough. You might think I'm crazy right now, but that's what I want you to be thinking about. Heavenly Father, help us to hear your word, to understand it, to let your words speak to us in such a way that however you want us to change, whatever you want us to do differently because of your word to us, that we would simply say, yes, Lord, make that change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, the uh, gospel lesson. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Question is, is, are there times when good is not good enough? Luke 10, starting at verse 38, going to read through verse 42. Probably a story that one or two of you, maybe all of you, have heard once or twice or many times before. It starts this way. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Martha came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. 
Who opened up her home? What's it say? What'd you hear? Martha. Martha. I just, I, just, I wanna just remind us, yes, I know again, probably many of us have heard this story, but maybe we just slow down a bit and listen to what Jesus is saying. Not that we haven't done that before, but maybe there's something new that God wants us to hear. Maybe there's something new that God wants us to change in our lives. And I might even go so far as to say, because of what I heard in the announcement a moment ago about what you're doing after church, that maybe there's something here that would apply in a very timely way to where you are as individuals and as a church. Martha's the one that opened her home. Martha was the one that was very busy with all of the preparations for Jesus. I say that <laughs> that way purposefully. Martha was busy ministering for Jesus. And then you have Mary. Where was she while we're told in the story that Martha has opened up her home and that Martha is very busy with all of the preparations and all of the details. Martha is right beside her helping out, <laughs> staying busy with Martha. No, of course, we know that it says Mary was sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to what Jesus was saying. So while Martha was busy ministering for Jesus, what was Mary busy doing? You don't have to answer, but I want, you to, I want, I want your thoughts to be sort of moving around here. Martha was busy ministering either for Jesus or you might say to Jesus with all the preparations and the opening up of her home and just busy with all the details. Martha is doing that while Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to what he had to say. Martha was busy ministering for him or to him while Mary was busy simply being with Jesus. Is there a difference? Eh, there's a difference. Even if I didn't think there was a difference. <laughs> Jesus makes it very clear. There is a very important difference between what the two of them where you were, what the two of them were doing. But let me just kind of take a step back and, and make sure that we would all agree that they were both, both of them were doing things that are very good. It isn't like Martha was doing bad things. It isn't like Martha was being sinful. <laughs> Martha was doing good things. Martha was doing probably what everybody would expect someone to do if anybody was coming to their home, let alone, could we say, let alone, if it was Jesus, got to have things ready, got to take care of things, got to serve him well, got to minister to him and for him, take care of all the details. And Martha's just, or, and Mary is just sitting at his feet, listening to what he had to say. And yet we know, maybe you knew long before this morning when you heard this story again, but we just heard it, we just read it again. Martha was the one that was, quote, distracted by all the preparations. And Martha is the one who Jesus said to, you are worried and upset. Now we're trying to hear, what does Jesus have to say to me, you individually today about our lives and what we're doing the choices that we're making, what we're busy at. But we're also, maybe you are thinking about what you, who you are as a group as well, wherever the Lord leads you today. But it's Martha that Jesus says to you, you're worried and upset about many things, but there are a few things that are needed. And indeed, only one. We have to think about for a moment here, and we will in a moment. What's the one thing? Jesus goes on to say, I'll say this first though, Jesus goes on to say there's only, uh, the only one thing in, uh, that you have to worry about and Mary has chosen the better thing. I mean, right up to that point, I'm thinking that Martha is still thinking, Jesus is about ready to give it to her. There's only one thing, you know, if it was me, wouldn't, I mean, I'd be thinking, yeah, and I'm still looking at Jesus while he's talking and I'm, I'm looking at my sister thinking, he's about ready to set you straight, Martha. And then he says, 
and Mary has chosen what is better. And, and then just kind of like double down. Mary has chosen what is better and it is the only thing. Don't forget this. It is the only thing that cannot be taken from her, from you. What all we know, all we know in the story is that what Mary was doing was indeed the better choice. And what Mary was doing is indeed the only thing that was important and the only thing that couldn't be taken from her. What was Mary doing? All we're told is that she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus, listening to the words of Jesus, letting the presence of Jesus and the words of Jesus and the heart of Jesus and the passion of Jesus transform her. Mary was going deeper into relationship with Jesus. Is it fair to say that while Martha, all that was happening, while Martha was doing some really good things, ministering for Jesus, being very busy, making sure that things were being taken care of, all of the details of life. I hope by now that you'll agree with me that sometimes being busy, even busy doing really good things, being busy doing the things that, you know, that society would expect us to do, that maybe the church people around us would expect us to do. I'm talking about the preparation for Jesus and opening up your home and making sure that he's welcomed and served well. That even those kind of good things might not be good enough if... I'm going to add a little bit to this, see if you agree with it or not. If what we're doing for Jesus isn't as an extension from the times we have spent with Jesus. Mary and Martha had a choice to make. Each of them made a choice. Each of them were doing really good things. And yet, here's a story that has been kept for us that we might read on a Sunday morning like this to teach us something. Every one of us teaches something about where we are right now, our mindset, our passion, our focus, our priorities. To teach us something about what we worry about, what we get upset about. Isn't that a part of what Jesus said? You're worried and upset about so many things, but only one thing is important. What was the one thing? Have you said it in your mind yet? What is the one thing that we can determine from this story? I mean, we, we might come up with all kinds of other answers. And if we were in a Bible study, and I've been here before, maybe you have been in this moment before, I'll ask a question and somebody will have all kinds of really good answers. And I'll keep saying, yeah, but what's the scripture say? What does the word say? What does it say in this story? And all we're told in this story is what? Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, listening to him relationship the one thing the one thing that could not be taken away from mary i don't think the story says that martha didn't have a relationship with jesus all it talks about is how martha was getting distracted from deepening her relationship with jesus because of all the things she was doing for him and to him in really really good ways and yet, Mary's the one that's sitting at his feet, listening to him, deepening her relationship, relationship with Jesus. That's the one thing that can't be taken away. Listening to his word, letting his word speak to us and change us and transform us. Do you hear that in the story? Mary and Martha are both doing really good things, and yet one of them chose to be with Jesus and one of them chose to be busy for Jesus. And I would add, first. Isn't it about what we do first? Because I think there's plenty of places in Scripture where we could go to and we would 
we would find the evidence, we would find the teaching that we're kind of supposed to be busy for Jesus. We're to be ministering and serving. But not if what we're doing doesn't come from a deepening relationship with Jesus. It's the one thing that cannot be taken away from us. I have to wonder, and maybe I'll pause right there. I have to wonder because of the evidence from my own life, and I don't think I'm all that abnormal or weird. So in other words, I think maybe there might be one or two people here like me over the years that has prioritized Martha's choices over Mary's choice. Get out, get busy, go work, do, without having spent time just being at the feet of Jesus in all of the ways that we could do that, just to be at the feet of Jesus and to listen to his word. You know, to, to be in worship, to be ready to be in worship, not just to be physically present in worship, but to be in worship, to come and to be open to the powerful presence of the almighty creator, redeemer, sustainer, God, to be fully present, even if no one else around us is, to be at the feet of Jesus in this moment, to be at the feet of Jesus when we're reading the word of God, the Bible, the scriptures on our own and quietly at home or somewhere out in God's created world, to be with others in a small group who are studying the word of God and asking questions and struggling together, to be in fellowship with one another and naming the name of Jesus and telling the stories of Jesus together, going deeper in our relationship with him because he's right in the middle of it. Is that what we do as a priority so that everything else that we do is an extension of our having spent, having spent time with Jesus. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't think I want to. Maybe if I say this, I really do, and I am just pretending. <laughs> I have to wonder. Here, here it is. Again, because of where I have come from, somebody who's grown up in the church and has a wonderful Christian family, mom and dad, and always attended church, always there, always a part of youth group. Always, after coming back from Iowa State University with an ag business degree and going back to our small town, and now we're the young family that's come back home to farm, and boy, you know, we're involved in church and everything else, and teaching the youth group and on the ad council and all those things. And yet, neither I nor many other people, also very, very, very busy doing Jesus stuff. If we were down at the elevator, you know, the co-op, or if we were at the feed store, or we were downtown at the grocery store, you'd never hear the name of Jesus come out of my mouth. You wouldn't find me listening to a friend, maybe a classmate who also graduated and now is back farming with me, and this, this guy says something and describes the struggle, the, the pain, the chaos that was going on in his life. In those beginning years, you would never have found me putting my hand on his shoulder and saying, could I pray for you in the name of Jesus? And I believe that maybe there are quite a few people in quite a few churches that outside of church, you will never hear the name of Jesus come out of their mouth except for in ways that maybe it shouldn't. And I know for myself, what I found is that I needed to spend a little bit of time with Jesus to make sure that I had the relationship that could never be taken away from me. I remember in those days back at the farm, young adult, beginning a family, going to Sunday school, doing all the things I just described. And one Sunday morning on a, uh, on a, in a class, in an adult class, I remember saying to the class when the scripture was quoted, Leo quoted this scripture. He said, um, until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will, joy will be made complete. And it just came blurting out of my mouth. That's not true. You don't say those kind of things in a small town United Methodist church as a young adult with all these elders, you know. And I say that in the most positive of ways. Well, he just came out. I said, I don't believe that. That isn't true for me. Until now, my joy isn't complete because I can ask for whatever I want to and I'll get it. 
That's not my experience. Awkward silence. For a few seconds, probably felt like a couple of minutes to the people in the class. And then Leo went, well, that's a very interesting take on that, Gary. Anyone else? And we just moved, and we just moved on. I mean, I get it. I mean, what are you going to do? Some crazy young adult like me making a crazy statement like that. From that moment forward, I began to say in my head and then say to the people around me, either all of this is true, and if it's true, all of this, all of this, all of this that we sing, either this is true, and if it is, I want a whole lot more of it than I have right now. Because it doesn't seem very real, doesn't seem very personal, doesn't seem very relational. Either it's real and I want more of it, of him, or if it's not real, if we're just making all this up to make ourselves feel better in a world filled with questions, then I have better things to do on a Sunday morning than waste my time. We pulled together a few others, classmates, the local bankers, some other people in the community. You know, uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 of us would start, would meet um, on a Thursday night every week and we'd open up the Bible and we started to study and we asked questions and we challenged what we were reading. We went and attended other churches in the area to try to figure out, does somebody else have this figured out that maybe we don't? I'll add, I'll add some words. Being busy, even for Jesus, isn't the same as being about the business of Jesus. And here's how I would follow that up. Because the business of Jesus, in this context, with what I'm talking about, what, what we're thinking about, I think the business of Jesus is being in relationship with him. That's just business number one. To be in relationship with Jesus. If that isn't where it starts, we're going to get tired. We're going to get frustrated. We might even look around at other people that are um, not as busy as we are, and even if it doesn't come out of our mouths, we might not be very happy with them. Remember Mary and Martha. <laughs> the business of Jesus, I don't know, as a pastor, should I quote John 3.16? <laughs> That's why Jesus came, right? That's why God so loved the world that he sent Jesus that whoever would believe in him, you know, hear his words, sit at his feet, get to know him, say yes to him, trust him. Whoever believeth in him would not, sometimes I don't even want to say this, because the world would say to me, this is too harsh. But these are the words of Jesus, so that I would not perish, but instead have everlasting life. You know why being about the business of Jesus is really important? Because it's the difference between eternal life and eternal death. That's what Jesus says to us. Where are you focused? What do you do first? Don't worry, for those of you who are wondering, is there going to be somebody here who's doing an awful lot that are just going to say, i got to stop doing everything that I'm doing. I'm not trying to tell you to stop being busy for Jesus. But I am wanting all of us to continually reflect on the difference between Mary and Martha and why Jesus said to Martha that the only thing we're told Mary was doing, which was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, why that was indeed the only thing that was important and the only thing that could not be taken from her. I might live for another minute, or 20 years. But what will make the difference is not fully filled up by me, by God. Then you can go do whatever you want to do, but you can't do all of the do stuff, the busy stuff, without having first been filled with God. I think, this, I think that's the same message. And then I think about later on in, in the first four chapters of the book of Acts. I was going to turn to it, but I probably... Should kind of move us to the end a little more quickly here. Chapter 3, chapter 4 uh, in the book of Acts, there's a story of Peter and John, and, and this is the story, one of those first stories of how the power of God, how being in relationship with Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, because that's what being in relationship leads to, 
The more time we spend at the feet of Jesus and listening to his words and saying yes to him and committing ourselves to him and surrendering to him, the more we're filled up with the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. And Peter and John heal this guy. And everybody, you know, the religious people are like, whoa, that, that's crazy. Don't be doing that. What are you talking about Jesus? He's dead. Don't talk. Don't preach Jesus resurrected. So they, they, held, they hold them for the night. Then they take them out the next day. Peter and John, they ask questions like, you know, and what power do you do this? And, and you know, all those kind of things. And, and eventually it gets to the point where they're like, we're confused. This is just Peter and John. We know them, and the scripture says, they are uneducated and untrained men. You know, they're just confused. Now, before I finish this, what it says in the scriptures, just remember, sometimes we get all bent out of shape as to all the things that we must do if we're going to grow as individuals, be more powerful as a witness for Jesus, or maybe even as a church, how can we be a witness to the community in which we live in such a way that it'll be attractive and other people might want to say, who are they and what are they doing? I want to check in and see what's going on there. So they look at Peter and John, the religious people around them, the community around them, they're going, this, this just makes no sense. Peter and John are untrained and uneducated. That's what the NIV uses to describe them. But what does it say next? It says, and then they realized they had been with Jesus. Acts chapter 4, read it. They recognized. It was like a, oh, the light bulb goes on. Oh, now I get it. No training, hadn't been to seminary. Untrained, uneducated, hadn't been to all the seminars and the workshops. Hadn't read all the latest books on church growth. But here's what they what others recognized about them. They had been with Jesus. And then the next verse says, and you know, and the guy that the healed is like right there. I mean, we can't say, oh, they didn't do anything amazing, powerful, life-changing, miraculous. No, they couldn't say that. The scriptures say that. And then the, because the guy that he was healed was right there, they couldn't say anything. Don't you want people around you to recognize that you have been with Jesus? That's what will change the world. That what is what will change my life, your lives, the lives that you touch in the workplace, in the community, in your neighborhood, in your church. It's, have you been with Jesus? Is his word changing you? When we, get, when we spend time with Jesus, it is only then Spending time with Jesus, listening to his words. Only then will we know who to give thanks to when things are going well. Only then will we have the faith, the confidence, the hope, and the peace that when things aren't going well, when there's chaos all around us, we'll still be able to stand strong and say, Thus saith the Lord. We'll know the source of our gifts, spiritual gifts. We'll have spiritual fruit. They'll know them by their fruit of love. That's where we want to be. Being busy is not the same. Being busy for Jesus is not the same as being with Jesus. Start with Jesus. Let him transform us, change us, empower us, and the world will know more and more about Jesus, and Jesus is the one who will attract others to himself. Yes, through us, because we're the ongoing body of Christ in the world today. The body of Jesus is gone, but the body of Christ, that's anyone here who has put faith in Jesus. But he wants us, in this case, not to say Martha was doing something not very good. No, that was good, but it just wasn't good enough when we compare it to being at the feet of Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of eternal life through faith in your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have said to us that the more time we spend nurturing our relationship with you, the more we surrender to you, the more we trust your word as the truth that will set us free, 
that not only will you change us, you will change the world in which we live, wherever we go, whatever we do. May that be true for each of us here today, for your good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for those um, who are present today with all of the good and all of the challenge that is represented here today, all of the stories that could be told of where we see you doing exactly what we have hoped and prayed for. And in those ways, Lord, where the prayers seem not yet to be answered, at least not in the ways that we would have hoped, that, Lord, you'll give us and others, those that we're praying for, patience and perseverance. We do pray for your healing power to be extended over those on the list of um, those needing prayers today, others that may not be listed here that we would offer up to you. May their healings and the way that you work in their lives and our lives be a witness, a testimony to the world around us. May we find our hope, may they find their hope, our peace, their peace in you. Would you give us confidence to continue uh, to pray and to be filled with hope and joy in this moment as we look forward to your coming again. Help us to know where to be involved and active in the world and always to share words that would lead people to you and not away from you or away from us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name as we pray together the prayer he taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and we'll sing together, Be Thou My Vision. flowing that the world around us might be touched by his presence as well. In his name we pray. Amen.